Well, today we, I would like to cover the history of reindeer in Alaska. And I'm just going to hit the highlights uh, because it, it is a, a very complex and rich history. You will look further into the history of reindeer in Alaska through your readings. So uh, I'll just get you started with, with a, a brief overview of how reindeer made it here in Alaska. And, well, uh, Alaska natives, uh, with you know, they uh, came over the the, the land bridge uh, many many years ago and developed a, a very uh, successful, unique technology to to live here in the north. They were able to harvest the resources, the marine mammals and, and the terrestrial mammals successfully in a very hostile, severe climate. And uh, there is a, a series of, of uh, settlements in, in northwest Alaska. Uh, most of these settlements, uh, Alaska Native settlements, uh, were uh, along river mouths. Uh, and to use the resources, the marine resources, both of the river and of, of the ocean. Uh, the marine mammals were harvested along with, with the salmon runs. And then uh, some of the terrestrial animals were harvested as well. And uh, there were some settlements that uh, existed in, in the interior that relied more on terrestrial resources, uh, the caribou. And th these particular settlements, uh, it was said that every second or third generation you would expect to, to starve. Uh, because uh, caribou populations are inherently cyclic and uh, they go through thrifty 30 to 50 year cycles. No one knows why they go through these cycles, but every 30 to 50 years the population will increase to a level and then decrease and, and go through a cycle of abundance and, and then they disappear from the landscape for a period of time. And caribou are very uh, whimsical. Uh, they'll change their migration routes. They'll be here one year and gone the next. So if you're a community that depends upon uh, harvesting of caribou, it's a tenuous existence. Uh, in some years uh, you have plenty to eat and some years you don't. So uh, you, you, you can see um, <coughs> people that, that settled around uh, the coast uh, associated with a harvesting of marine and aquatic uh, resources, there was a higher density of people. Uh, the, the, the resources, the harvesting of resources was much more predictable. The salmon showed up every year and, and the whales, uh, the marine mammals uh, that migrated through every year. So the, the resources were predictable and and could support uh, a, a greater number of people. But the communities that uh, depended upon terrestrial resources, the caribou, um, it was much more unpredictable and con could not support the same density of people. And, but people hunted caribou on the Sura Peninsula for hundreds, thousands of years. And it's really quite interesting. You can fly over the Sura Peninsula and you can see these vestiges of these large uh, caribou, I, I guess you would call them funnels or corrals. And they were, they were, you know, they're made out of rocks and willows and caribou antlers. And uh, at, as the caribou migrated through, the, the Alaska natives would drive them into this funnel, would drive them into a lake. When the animals got in the lake, uh, the caribou were in the lake. Uh, you paddled out on your kayak, and you were able to harvest quite a few, few, few caribou. Uh, a, a very <coughs> successful uh, technology if the caribou were present. Uh, the Sewer Peninsula uh, had a resident herd of caribou up until oh, the 1850s and 1860s uh, when they they disappeared. Uh, 
<clears throat> before they disappeared, there's a, a couple of communities, uh, Kawarik and, and the Buckland area on the Sierra Peninsula that uh, depended upon uh, caribou. <clears throat> And so during the 1850s and 60s, uh, we saw the disappearance of, of caribou uh, from the Sura Peninsula. And, and we saw a general decline in the western Arctic herd during that time. And, and so those particular resources weren't available for harvest by, by the native people. And, Along with this disappearance of uh, terrestrial animals, the, the caribou, the whaling industry moved over to the Atlantic from the Pacific in the mid-19th century. And they began to harvest these very predictable marine resources, the whales and, and the walrus. And so now there is a, a d demand on <clears throat> or a, a, an apparent shortage of both the marine resources and the terrestrial resources for the, the local people. And along with the whalers, when, when they showed up, they, of, of course, uh, brought their uh, <clears throat> European uh, culture along with them. And uh, the whalers actually developed a technology to overwinter in Alaska and instead of making the, the dangerous trip back to uh, southern ports and overwintering there. Uh, they were able to uh, freeze their whaling ships in, in the ice and they were able to overwinter. And, and so with, with that, they started to change the social, cultural landscape of, of northwestern Alaska. We saw the <clears throat> appearance and, and spread of, of European culture in, in Alaska. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> when uh, the whaling ships, the, the uh, more permanent um, communities became established, uh, we saw traders and we, we saw a, a whole different, we saw a very different change in, in the culture up here. Uh, prior to 1884, uh, the military uh, controlled, managed Alaska. But in 1884, uh, there was passage of, of the Organic Act, which is essentially set up Alaska as, uh, a, set Alaska for dish, judicial and, and civil rule. Uh, we, we could establish uh, ju judicial districts and uh, we could set up a, a school district and a school system. So we established these civil districts and along with the civil districts, uh, we, uh, or people in, in Alaska and the country wanted to establish an education system. And <laughs> so there was a board of education established and uh, the first director of, of the Board of Education in Alaska was Dr. Sheldon Jackson. And Jackson, he had worked with uh, uh, Native people in, in the Rocky Mountains, Colorado, uh, to be more specific. And so uh, he was selected to run the Board of Education and set up an education system in Alaska. And uh, he eventually was the person that successfully introduced uh, reindeer into Alaska. But Sheldon Jackson, he came to Alaska and he, he saw what was happening in these communities, that there was a, a shifting of, of culture over, over to um, a European culture. And, and so he, and Sheldon Jackson and others said, geez, well, we, we need to do something else there's going to be, and they referred it to it as the extinction of the Eskimos. We need to integrate uh, the Eskimos into this European culture. Uh, so he, uh, when he uh, established uh, th this, uh, <coughs> when, when he went about to establish the school system, he adver advertised for, for teachers uh, and said, 
and uh, he put it very bluntly, you are going to have to be uh, pretty tough to be able to teach in, in Alaska. It's very uncomfortable and uh, it's a very severe climate. Uh, you're going to be a long ways from nowhere and, and so you just uh, better, better be prepared for it. And, and so Jackson, he hired four uh, teachers and that were to establish missions, uh, one at Point Hope, one at Point Barrow, and two at uh, Cape Prince of Wales. Uh, <clears throat> so he estab established these uh, schools uh, built schools at these locations, uh, but Jackson, he was also a missionary, and so uh, he integrated both religion and education. Uh, he felt it was very important that uh, people received both an education, but also uh, he wanted to make sure they they were converted to Christianity as well. So he set up a education system uh, that, w that was both educational and uh, religious in context. <clears throat> well, uh, Jackson, he liked to wander around Alaska and at, at the time, uh, <clears throat> The uh, enforcement of laws and uh, the collection of taxes uh, in this in Alaska at the time was through the Revenue Service, and there were some ships up here, uh, uh, the revenue cutters. They were essentially responsible for collection of taxes and enforcing uh, the laws in Alaska at the time. Uh, there was very one colorful character and he was very essential in the introduction of reindeer into Alaskan. It was Captain Michael Healy and he was captain of the bear. And, uh, uh, and through your readings you will see what an amazing character he was. It was just a daily occurrence. Uh, he, would, he would end up sailing whale, save whalers. Uh, uh, the whaling ships were constantly going aground and, and breaking up their shipwrecks up and down the Alaskan coast all the time. Healy would be there to, to save the whalers. Uh, and, uh, there was uh, an Alaska Native community starving. He'd bring them food. He was just an all-around good guy. He was, at the time, the hero of Alaska. He took care of, of everyone. And, and so um, Captain Healy, he was at a trip, he had to go over to Siberia and he was actually uh, taking gifts over to the Koryak people. There was an American whaling ship that shipwrecked off uh, the uh, Siberian coast and some of the whalers were stranded. The Koryak people uh, took these uh, American whalers in and, and took very good care of them and uh, actually these people ended up, uh, these whalers, stranded whalers, ended, ended up back in Alaska. Uh, well, the, the the government was very appreciative of, of the efforts by these Koryak people, so they decided, well, we need to uh, reward that behavior in, in case there's any more ships that, that shipwreck over there. Uh, it, it would be <coughs> nice to uh, establish that behavior pattern where if the the, the ships wreck, uh, the local people will take very good care of the people. Well, Healy was headed over with with a, a, a shipload of gifts for the Koryak people in appreciation for taking good care of of the whalers. Uh, well, Jackson <clears throat> decided to go along because he had heard from Healy ab about the reindeer industry over there, and and. It was actually Healy's idea that maybe introducing reindeer into Alaska was a good idea, but Sheldon Jackson wanted to see it for himself. So they headed over to uh, Siberia and Sheldon Jackson uh, saw uh, the, 
the, the Russian reindeer industry in action and the, the people look very happy, they were well fed, uh, <coughs> there wasn't this uh, recurring bouts of starvation that he saw over in Alaska. So he felt uh, very strongly that this w was the, the solution uh, to, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, avoid what, what he turned the extinction of Eskimos in Alaska. So, but uh, Jackson had to get funding uh, for this project, and he went back to the government congress and he pleaded his case and said, uh, you know what, we can either uh, put uh, the Alaska Natives on the public dole, we're going to have to supply them with, with food and support them, or we can introduce reindeer into Alaska and uh, then the Alaska Native people can use the reindeer as, as a, a, a food source and a meat source. And uh, there were some critics, there were some people that in, in Congress then didn't think it was a good idea, but, but overall they did approve of the plan, but they were just a little bit unsure of, it, of Sheldon's idea. They did not know if reindeer would be able to make the trip uh, from Siberia over to Alaska. So they uh, uh, said, okay, Jackson, we will, we will uh, give you, fund, fund you later if you can demonstrate first that the Russians will actually sell you reindeer and secondly, will reindeer survive the trip over uh, across the Bering Sea. Uh, Jackson went <coughs> to his uh, missionary connection and actually got funding from the Presbyterian Mission to fund this initial uh, pilot uh, trial and uh, uh, reindeer introduction into Alaska. He acquired $2,000 Healy and Jackson that went back to uh, Siberia. Uh, uh, and it, it was a pr actually a pretty tough sell. The, the herders over there were very suspicious, but uh, eventually uh, they found a couple of herders. They had to throw some r some rifles in, into the deal uh, to get it to go. But uh, eventually they they did run across a couple of herders that sold them 16 reindeer in 1891. Uh, they threw him in the hold of, of the bear and they had sailed uh, 15, 1600 miles out to uh, actually the Aleutian chain, uh, a Macnac in an Alaska that threw the reindeer out in, in the fall and uh, came back next spring and the deer had survived and they're doing very well. So uh, with that information, uh, data, and that one, and he could find Siberian herders that would sell reindeer, and uh, you could successfully uh, transport reindeer across the Bering Strait, that Congress did finally approve uh, some funding for uh, purchase and movement of reindeer over to Alaska. In 1892, uh, Jackson and uh, Healy went over and purchased uh, 171 reindeer and threw them in the bear, in the hold of the bear, uh, came across the strait and uh, they landed at Point Clarence and uh, 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 the deer were hobbled, tied up, their legs were tied up and uh, they unhobbled them, they kicked them off the, 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 the bear and they, they swam to shore and uh, uh, the deer uh, did very well. <coughs> well, as I said before, Jackson felt it was very important for uh, Alaska natives to become integrated in European culture. And, it, and uh, to do that, and he wanted to uh, get uh, to uh, in, entice Alaska Natives into an apprenticeship program 
to uh, teach and train Alaska Natives uh, the, the, the white way of doing things. And so um, <clears throat> he uh, b brought uh, the reindeer over. Uh, they were managed by the missions, uh, the mission schools originally, and there was an apprenticeship program set up. And it, at first, Jackson brought over Siberian herders as, as the teachers, uh, but that didn't go very well uh, because uh, the, the Chukchi herders and the Alaskan people, they have been mortal enemies for a long time, so it just had not worked out very well. So uh, Jackson said, sent a, a person, Kellen, over to uh, Scandinavia, Norway, and Sweden, and recruited Sami reindeer herders to come over as mentors, uh, teachers for Alaska Natives, and to run this apprenticeship program out of the, the missions in Northwest Alaska. And it was, it was very successful. One of the problems with the apprenticeship program, the, the Sami herders, uh, the payment uh, for, uh, the, they were given reindeer as payment for uh, the, their teaching, for the mentorship. The 15 reindeer a year. Uh, the Sami herd and the, the Sami herders trainers were given 15 reindeer a year. Uh, the apprenticeships, the Alaska Native apprentices, uh, were not given as many uh, reindeer. Uh, they were just given six reindeer a year to start, and then after that, they were given uh, eight reindeer. Uh, but what they could do with the reindeer was greatly restricted. They had to get permission to slaughter any male reindeer and they could not sell or pass on through inheritance any female reindeer. And that wasn't true for the Sami herders. Uh, they had full title freedom to do with their reindeer what, whatever uh, they, they could do. <laughs> but this Introduction was very successful. The reindeer did very well. Um, and Jackson and Healy went over and purchased, uh, over a period of years, uh, 1,280 reindeer, brought them over to Alaska. Uh, the the, uh, the Alaska the range, the forage in Alaska, was excellent. Uh, we very good recruitment rate, and the herds did very well. But this apprenticeship program, and it it was first administered by the missions. The missions actually owned the animals. And some non-native Alaskans, the, the Sami herders, the, the mentors, they were given reindeer, entitled to the reindeer, and and so. Uh, there were some critics, some people uh, were a little upset by that uh, because the original intent of bringing reindeer was to help Alaska Natives. And uh, after, after several years, four to six, eight years, most of the reindeer were owned by the missions and by uh, Sami people, not Alaska Natives. So there was a big push to get more reindeer into the hands uh, of, of Alaska Natives. Uh, later in the, in the course, uh, you are, we are going to talk about uh, uh, these amazing reindeer journeys at, at the time. Uh, the history of reindeer Alaska is filled with these amazing trail drives across an incredible landscape. And <clears throat> in 1898, uh, there were some whaling ships stranded up at Point Barrow. And uh, uh, there was a reindeer herder at the time, Charlie Antisirluk. And he had the largest native herd at the time. Uh, his animals were actually indentured. <laughs> 
to uh, be used to go up as to both haul supplies and to be used as a food source to help these trapped whalers up, up by Point Bureau. But also at the time, and in, in 1897, there was a drought in, in Alaska, and uh, the water level in the Yukon River had dropped, and so the, the steamships uh, could not get up to uh, the gold mines around Dawson Creek to, to resupply the miners. And so the miners panicked, oh my God, we don't have enough supplies, enough food to make it through the winter, we're gonna starve. There was a big panic. Uh, and, and so what are we going to do? Uh, and Jackson at the time suggested, well, let's just get uh, reindeer. And, and there was a person, Kelman, over in Norway at the time recruiting for more uh, Sami teachers. And <clears throat> Jackson said, well, let's let's recruit some uh, Sami herders and get some deer and let's just bring them over and they can go and, and, and save the miners up in Dawson. Well, that's actually uh, pretty amazing that you can throw reindeer in a ship at the time in Norway, cross the Atlantic, all, you take them all the way to New York City, uh, you take them out of the holds of the ship, you put them in railroad cars, you ship them all the way across the United States. Uh, you get them over to San Francisco, you throw them in another ship, and you take them all the way up to Haines, uh, where you kick them out of the boat, uh, you load hundreds of pounds of, of food and supplies on their back, and you uh, drive them all the way up to Dawson, and then you eat them. I, it, 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 that is just amazing the, <coughs> that uh, reindeer uh, have been that useful and uh, are capable of, of both the transportation and, and these amazing feats. Uh, as you can, can tell, I'm, I'm very biased towards reindeer, but they are amazing animals. Uh, that, uh, that they're docile, uh, you can throw them in a ship and they do quite well. Uh, we move reindeer around all the time in a trailer and it, and it is uh, pretty amazing. They can be excited and a little bit nervous. You put them in a trailer, you head down the road and they settle right down and they just get into the flow uh, of going down the road and, and they do quite, quite well. So, like I said, we will cover the details of, of this journey and, and some other uh, reindeer journeys later in the course. So I don't want to go into too much detail right now. Af after reindeer were introduced, like I said, the reindeer populations were doing quite well. Uh, we were, uh, the population increased. There was five or 6,000 reindeer by... Uh, 1900. Gold was discovered in Nome in 1897. A big, large influx of, of people to Nome. Uh, there was a city actually sprung up on the beaches of Nome, a tent city. And, and so you had a, a, a very quick, huge influx of people in Nome, and of, of, of course, uh, people had, had to eat. And so uh, all of a sudden there was a market for reindeer meat and, and so uh, the missions and, uh, and actually the Sami people were selling quite a bit of reindeer meat to, to the miners. And not only were they selling reindeer and <coughs> reindeer meat, they were also leasing that reindeer out as, as transportation. And <coughs> Like I said, reindeer are amazing animals, uh, very useful. Uh, you're a miner, you throw all your gear on the back of a reindeer, uh, you, you head up through the hills, uh, you get to w w where you're going to mine, uh, your supplies are there, and then you can just eat the transportation.